This is Banjo, and today I'm going over the use of the APG-63 radar found in the F-15C in DCS World. Today I'll primarily be focusing on the long-range search mode, covering the close combat acquisition modes at a later date. To activate the radar, simply press the I key, and we can see the radar come online. Explaining the symbology, starting at the center, we could see the horizon line. As I pitch and bank the aircraft, we'll see it adjust at the center of the display. This allows you, while your head's down looking at the radar, to maneuver around without crashing into the ground. Just inside the horizon line, we can see the target designator cursor. We can salute this around, place it on an aircraft contact, press target lock to lock the contact. Low and high band elevation coverage for the position of the TDC is displayed on the left side of the display and can be adjusted with scan zone up and scan zone down. This essentially shows the minimum and maximum altitude being scanned at the current time at the position of the TDC cursor. As we see as I slew the cursor around, these values will adjust accordingly. Current display range is indicated at the upper right hand portion of the display and is set by simply slewing the cursor to the top or bottom of the display to increase or decrease the display range. Current pulse repetition frequency is displayed on the lower left. Antenna azimuth is indicated by the carrot currently slewing left and right along the bottom of the display. Antenna elevation is indicated by the carrot which is currently falling along the left side of the display and resetting at the top. Elevation can be tilted 60 degrees up or down, and by default, azimuth will be scanning a wide angle of 60 degrees. Pressing the decrease scan zone binding will set a 30 degree azimuth scan, at which point we can see slewing the TDC will also slew the antenna azimuth. On a 30 degree scan, we can see the scan rate is increased, although you can miss targets outside of the scan zone. At this point, I've pointed the radar in the direction of a few groups of air contacts, and once it completes its scan, you'll see them pop up. At this point, we can see one group of enemy contacts, indicated by the rectangular icons, and one group of friendly contacts, indicated by the circular icons. Since these targets are halfway down the display, I'll set the display range for half its value by slewing down until it says 40 miles. At this point, I'll also reset the antenna elevation for the value I expect them to be at for the next while. So at this point we can see I'm scanning between 4 and 26,000 feet at 20 miles with a display range of 40 miles. We can see that as the target moves across the display, its old indicator icon is left behind and slowly fades out. This is the target history and it allows you to get an idea of where a target is if you once lost them or if they're rapidly moving you can get an idea of the direction they're moving. To demonstrate this a bit better, I'll set the antenna elevation to a higher value to lose the targets, and we'd see a few seconds later, they fade away. At this point, if I reset the antenna back down to where I expect them, we'd see them pop right back into view. Next, I'll demonstrate the importance of setting the antenna elevation to the expected target altitude. As I move it down to zero feet, you can see a pair of enemy MiGs skimming the ground that were hiding at the same range as those friendlies. 25 miles. We know they're at 25 miles because each horizontal line on the display is a quarter of its display range, and currently at 40 miles. With them between the 2 and 3 line, that places them at 25 miles. Next, I'll demonstrate the effect of pulse repetition frequency. Here we can see a group popping in and out at 20 miles when I'm set on medium pulse repetition frequency. Although, when I'm set on medium, I can't see the group at 40 miles. Though when I'm set on higher interleaved settings, I can see the groups at 40 miles, although I can't detect the group at 20 miles. The interleaved setting will alternate between high and medium, although at a reduced range. So generally, it's a better idea to roll around on high if you're chasing head-on targets, or medium if the targets are running from you, if you have an idea of where they are. If you don't, then interleaved is the way to go. When a contact that happens to be running as jammer is encountered, it will appear as a series of stacked contact icons with a line running vertically through them. As we can see, we can't tell the contact's range. In fact, we can see the contact at any range we set the display range to because the jammer is that powerful. We can also detect the contact on medium pulse repetition frequency while he's hot at ranges further than we normally would be able to. Even if we try to lock this contact, his range, aspect, speed, and altitude will be an unknown until we burn through his jammer. It is possible to get a rough estimate as to the target's altitude even though he is jamming. If I start slewing the antenna's elevation to a higher value as to lose the target, I can see that he's below the value I set. Then if I start setting it to a lower value and try to find where he's above, I can start getting a rough estimate as to the altitude that he's sitting within. For example, I know this target is somewhere between 0 and 20,000 feet, which isn't a great estimate, but it gives me a general idea. As you cut the range to the jamming target, you'll be able to burn through as jammer, at which point we can see that the target is drawn normally on the display. At this point, if I were to lock the target, all the regular information of range, aspect, speed, altitude, and target identification will be listed. 
that we'd still see on the bottom right corner of the HUD is still this jam. So I still know the target is jamming, although I have burnt through his jammer. At this point I'll explain single target track. When in long range scan, if you salute the TTC over a contact and press target lock, the radar will enter a single target track, indicated by STT in the lower left corner of the display. We see the symbology changes. We can see that the contact now has its aspect drawn, and we can see only the single contact that we're tracking. Target's altitude is displayed on the left in thousand and hundreds of feet. This contact is 500 feet off the deck. True airspeed for the track target is displayed on the upper left, currently 263 knots. Target heading is displayed on the top, heading of 189 currently. Closure rate is displayed to the left of the current range carrot. The steering dot in the lower left portion of the display currently would be placed in the center of the angular steering air circle to ensure best chance of hit when taking a shot. The ASC circle will grow larger as range decreases. The marks on the right side relate to the weapon's DLZ. Starting at the top, it's range probability to intercept, range turn and run, and then arm in. Ground speed of the track target is displayed on the lower left of the display. Target ID, if detected by the NCTR system, is displayed to the right, currently unknown. Pre-launch time to missile intercept is displayed. And finally, bearing and range to the track target are displayed. It's at about this point that the NCTR system is able to ID the enemy plane, and we'll see it change from unknown to MiG-29. The range will vary, although on a high aspect target, 20 miles the system should be able to detect the target. If I were to prosecute an attack on this particular target, I wouldn't lock it until about 10 to 15 miles, at which point I would maneuver to place the steering dot in the center of the ASE circle, at which point I would check that the current range marker falls just under the range turn and run marker, which will ensure the highest probability to kill, as any maneuvering target will be able to defeat the AMRAM launch if you launch any past range turn and run. At these low altitudes, this will all happen quickly and at short ranges, although if you're up at 20, 30,000 feet, the ranges would be significantly increased. As I set the display range for 20 miles, we can better see the scale along the right portion of the display, indicating the weapon's DLZ. The first marker, range probability of intercept, is against a target that isn't maneuvering, that's basically flying straight into your missile without any evasive maneuvers. This will never happen, so never fire at that range. The next mark, at the top of the vertical rectangle, is range to turn and run. This is a shot made against a target that breaks away from the missile and runs in the opposite direction at launch. Chance to kill is significantly higher, although if you fire right as it enters that range, you'll still probably miss, so it's better to get it somewhere between our min and range to turn and run. At this point, we see that the current range just passed range probability of intercept. Shortly, it will pass the range to turn and run marker. I'll wait till it gets a little further down, and then I'll take the shot. In combat, very rarely will the enemy aircraft let you get this close before they'll take a shot on you. Although in the F-15, you generally do get the first shot, as the Russians' best chance for a successful kill is 15 kilometers less. One important thing to remember about firing the AIM-120 is that its range to go pit bull is roughly 8 to 10 miles. So if you can fire somewhere around that value, the missile will go pit bull off the rail, allowing you to break the lock and notch away. With long range scan and single target track out of the way, we'll next cover trackball scan. To enter track while scan mode, simply hold right alt I and the radar will enter track while scan as indicated by the TWS indicated at the lower left of the display. You can see now we have target altitude displayed above any detected targets. If I salute the TDC over one of the targets press target lock, we can see that I can track the target, get all the relevant information while continuing to scan for other targets. This allows us to track while scanning. This locked target becomes the primary designated target and if I lock another target it becomes the secondary designated target. This allows me to lock a series of targets and fire a series of missiles in a volley and it will jump from one target to the next in the order that I lock them. Each target that I soft lock is assigned a value sequentially in the order that I assign them. We can see targets 1, 2, and 3 on the display. If I hover the TDC over a target that I've locked and press the TWS unlock binding, it will unlock that particular target. If I press target unlock, it will unlock all track targets. And if I hover over a target that I've soft locked, and press target lock, it will enter a single target track on the target that I'm hovering the TDC over. This allows you to volley fire on the targets you've sequentially tracked and track will scan, or to simply lock a target and fire on a primary designated target and single target track, saving you from re-entering long range scan. Here we can see an example of volley firing on targets tracked and track will scan. Here we can see I've bugged four enemy contacts and at this point I'm going to get within the range to turn and run and fire off a pair of M120s at the first group and I'm going to bank into the second group 
place the steering dot in the center of the ASC circle and fire when the range looks good. Looking at the HUD, we can see the TDC box will jump from one target to the next upon firing. Once we fire on the last track target, we will jump back to the first target. The reason the system doesn't jump back to the first two targets I launched on was I lost them when I turned into these targets, likely when the two missiles hit them. Two things to note about trackwell scan are that it will assume scan mode's current PRF setting and that your scan azimuth will be limited to 30 degrees.